I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Wednesday night class. Uh, we're in the study of Romans. We left off last time in the 11th chapter, and we'll start with verse 6 tonight. <clears throat> Before we do, though, let's uh, have a, a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time that we can gather together to study more of thy word and learn thy will for us. We pray that we may be blessed in our doing so and that we may be a blessing to those who are outside of the body of Christ. We pray now that they would uh, keep us in our care, that we would continue to dwell on the treasure that is thy word. And in all things, not our will, but thine be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I have kind of a little cold here, so maybe uh, <clears throat> coughing more than usual. It says in verse 6, if and if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. If grace alone saved man, then, then obedience uh, was not necessary. If keeping the law perfectly saved man, then grace is not needed. Grace is needed because man could not keep the law perfectly. Acts of obedience were needed to perfect grace. Remission of sins under Christ depends on certain conditions. Now, these conditions are acts or actions. One cannot conclude from this that grace is excluded and remission of sins is solely based on merit. Two, three, or four acts do not constitute keeping the whole law, amounting then to perfect obedience. A few acts amount only to only partial obedience, which then requires grace. A few acts no more exclude grace than does grace exclude a few acts. The only acts that exclude grace are acts amounting to perfect obedience. And the only acts that grace excludes are acts amounting to perfect obedience. Perfect obedience does not require grace. Partial obedience demands grace. In fact, partial obedience cannot save. It requires grace. However, partial obedience to the antecedent conditions required of an alien sinner to obtain remission of sins cannot be secured by grace. Therefore, belief, uh, repentance, confession, and baptism, if unfulfilled, cannot be covered by grace. Perfect obedience to these conditions antecedent to remission of sins is the only obedience acceptable to God. Beyond that, partial obedience to law is the only obedience possible to man and is covered by grace. In uh, verse 7, what then? <clears throat> Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And uh, in the Greek, uh, it's Greek passive, that word kind of means petrify or harden. Israel has sought acceptance by God, but it has been obtained by only a remnant. The elect, that's Jew and Gentile, uh, both, it's, it's those who obeyed Christ, obtained acceptance by God. The order is that they obeyed first and then were elected or chosen. Those who rejected Christ were hardened in their hearts. 
But who did the hardening? The Calvinist would say that God did. Now the Greek, my word is passive, which means that something or someone blinded the rest, quote unquote. To say that God did it is without support. Now, this is a self-hardening, or at least a hardening caused by Satan. God never hardened any man to prevent him from doing right or to lead him to do wrong. God is not the author of sin. That goes against his nature. He may permit other agencies such as Satan and the wickedness of men, to harden hearts, but he never does it. And just as it is written in verse 8, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And uh, those uh, verses are taken from a number of uh, Old Testament passages uh, such as uh, Deuteronomy 29 verse 4 yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day and then Isaiah 29th chapter verse 10 for the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes uh, namely the prophets and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. Or Ezekiel, the second, uh, 12th chapter, verse 2. Uh, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and ears to hear, but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. These uh, God has done... Uh, as punishment for rejecting the Christ. But it is within their power to awaken, to see, and to hear, but they will not. Uh, they prefer it this way, and so in this condition, God leaves them as they are. <clears throat> in verse 9, And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. That comes from the uh, Psalms, the 69th Psalm, verse 22. Let their table become a snare before them, and their well-being a trap. Uh, this is first spoken of uh, David's enemies. And here is it intended as a prophecy against those who reject Christ. And we'll find this a lot in the uh, prophecies. They'll have devil uh, meanings or uh, devil subjects. Their table is the table at which they take their daily fare. And so he's saying, may this table become a snare and a trap in which they are caught rather than an enjoyment of a well-provisioned meal. This snare and trap are a recompense for rejecting Christ. In verse 10, let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their back always. And that comes from the 23rd verse of that same psalm. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. So it's saying, let the uh, spiritual eyes of those of Israel who reject Christ become darkened. Let their perception become blunted and their understanding dull, that they may remain ignorant. They willfully refuse to see the Christ as their Messiah. Therefore, let them alone in their blindness. This is what they prefer. Lay heavy burdens of troubles on those who reject Christ such that it bends down their backs to be alleviated only if they accept Christ. In verse 11, I say then, 
Have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy or emulation, if you will, salvation has come to the Gentiles. The Jews indeed have stumbled at the stumbling stone mentioned in chapter 9, verse 33. It is denied that the purpose of the stumbling was to cause their fall. The fall they did. So what fall is denied? It must be a fall that has a remedy. That remedy is the gospel. And it remains open to them. The extent and duration of the fall depends on how long they continue to reject the gospel. Was it God's intention that the Jews should uh, would fall? Uh, well, it cannot be God's intention, for he never intends anyone to sin. Their stumbling was by their own willful act, to which God was not the instigator, only the punisher. Out of their fall, God sought some good. But how did the fall of the Jews cause the salvation of the Gentiles? Or, or at least, uh, how did it contribute to it? If we cannot conclude that one event was essential to the other, then it must have been only incidentally. The Jews as a nation rejected Christ. This left the whole force of the gospel to be spent on the Gentiles, resulting in their conversion on a greater scale. The destruction of the Jewish nation crushed out their offensive sense of uh, superiority. This would have proved an impediment to the conversion of the Gentiles if this were allowed to continue. Had the Jewish nation not rejected Christ, they will have been continually corrupting and enfeebling the gospel message by mixing it with their own peculiar customs and tenets. So these factors, along with perhaps others, did incidentally contribute to the salvation of the uh, Gentiles. A better translation than provoked to jealousy uh, would be to provoke them to emulation. As strong has it to stimulate alongside, to excite to rivalry. The word uh, is used again in verse 14, and we'll get to that later. And it's translated by the King James translators as provoked to emulation. The idea then is to excite the Jews to emulate the obedience of the Gentiles but it did not. In verse 12, now if the, their fall is riches to the world, or for the world, and their failure riches, uh, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? The world, quote unquote, and the Gentiles, quote unquote, that includes everyone. Fall and failure, uh, quote unquote, refer to the same thing. And riches means benefit. So how did uh, Israel's fall and failure abound to the benefit of the world? Well, the scripture doesn't say uh, specifically. So we have to infer it. We can set forth uh, certain ways that the fall of the Jews benefited the world. But I you know, must say that uh, these are speculations and they're not... Uh, they're not exactly, uh, they don't have scriptural support, but they're not, uh, violate, they don't violate scripture either, so you can be your own judge about that. But one way is the fall of the Jews uh, was followed by their dispersion among all nations. Uh, they carried with them the idea of one living and true God. Now that they didn't get right. <clears throat> Two, although the uh, Jews rejected Christ, they still showed all nations that their prophets foretold a redeemer and taught them to look for one. 
It's just that the Jews didn't recognize it when he came. <clears throat> wherever the Jews uh, went, a uh, uh, third point, uh, wherever they went, they denounced idolatry. Uh, this prepared the Gentile mind for the notion of one supreme God. Fourth point is that the Jews taught all nations that the true origin of man was it was in Adam, not in the myriad of myths and fables that were propagated by the Gentiles. Fifth point is they gave the world true knowledge of the origin of sin and the fall of man. The sixth point is they carried with them in the laws of Moses the finest system of civil polity and equity in the world, and this aided in forming the civilization of all enlightened nations. In the seventh point, the prophets had foretold their, their downfall in case they rejected Christ. As it happened, they became the living proof that these prophecies were true. In all these ways, the world benefited from Israel's fall. Their fall opened the way for the blessings of the gospel to be carried to Gentiles as well as Jews, that is, to the whole world. Although Israel did not have to fall to teach these things, their fall and subsequent scattering was assurance that the world would uh, learn of these points. If the fall and failure of the Jews would benefit the world, how much more so if the Jews accepted Christ as the Messiah? The how much more their fullness, quote unquote, is the opposite of quote unquote uh, fall and failure. So I speak, verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles uh, inasmuch as I am a an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify, or the ASV uses glorify, I magnify my ministry. <clears throat> what Paul has just said, he is saying to the Gentiles, whatever the fall and failure are to the Jews have approved the, uh, that has proved a blessing to you. Although Paul has been talking at length about the Jews, he reminds the Gentiles that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. And he magnifies or uh, glories in that office. That is, he honored and respected the office of an apostle to the Gentiles by actively and vigorously exercising the duties and obligations of the office to the full extent of uh, his abilities. Magnify or glorify comes from the Greek word doxadzo, uh, which becomes doxa. And uh, I forget which commentary I used to get the uh, this definition, but it means to glorify. Doxadzo means to glorify. The consequential meaning from the opinion which forms one, which one forms, is to recognize, honor, praise, and invest with dignity, to give anyone esteem or honor by putting him into an honorable position. So to honor, to do honor to, hold in honor by the most uh, devoted administration of it, uh, endeavoring to convert as many Gentiles as possible. Now this uh, uh, cognate of this word is doxa, and you can see in this word, the English word doxology, uh, which is dignified, glory, glory, glorious, honor, praise, worship, so forth. In verse uh, 14 of chapter 11, it goes on, continues the thought, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy again, emulation, those who are my flesh, that is, the Jews, and save some of them. <clears throat> 
as a continuation of the thoughts of verse uh, 13, his aim was to convert as many Gentiles as possible in the hopes that it would provoke the Jews to jealously, in the sense that they would emulate the Gentiles and be converted as well. Well, they did provoke them to jealousy, but not to emulation. Only then uh, could they expect to regain favor with God if they converted by their obedience to the Christ. Although there were Jews who did convert and then were added to the church, uh, the vast majority stayed out. In verse 15, for if they're being cast out, cast away is a reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? The Jews were rejected because they had rejected the Christ. Because of this, the gospel was preached to the Gentiles. Reconciling the world, quote unquote, has to be taken in a, a limited sense since not all Gentiles believed on Christ, but uh, only some of them. Now, however, the gospel was open to all the world, Jew and Gentile alike could now be reconciled to Christ. But uh, what if the Jews accepted Christ? Uh, what effect would that have on the world, that is, uh, Jew and Gentile alike? Of course, those alienated from Christ are spiritually dead. And we know that the only means to spiritual life is obedience to his gospel. In verse 16, it says, For the first fruit is holy. The lump, uh, you think of the lump as a massive dough. The lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And we're not going to read it all, but uh, that uh, idea comes from Leviticus, the uh, 23rd chapter, verses 9 through 14. And uh, there in verse 10, it talks about, You shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And on down to verse 14, You shall eat uh, neither bread nor parched grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It also uh, comes from Numbers uh, 15, chapter verses 17 through 21, and we're not going to read all that either. It talks about there in verse 20, you shall offer up a cake of the first of your ground meal. Verse 21, of the first of your ground meal, you, you shall give to the Lord a heave offering. So when the harvest was gathered and before it could be used, it had to be consecrated or rendered ceremonially ceremonially holy a cake of the uh, first of the ground meal uh, from the parched or fresh grain was first offered as a heave offering uh, that made the rest of the harvest suitable for use the first fruits quote unquote were the jews uh, the lump would be the remainder of the nation of israel if the Jews who first accepted Christ as Messiah were holy, then the whole nation of Israel was capable of being holy and accepted by God on the same basis as the first uh, fruits. But they did not, and accordingly were not accepted. They are not, however, irrevocably rejected, but will be accepted when they obey. If the root of a tree is healthy, then the tree itself will most likely be healthy, including its branches. Like the immediately preceding analogy that the first Jewish Christian converts, that is the roots, are holy, then the rest of the Jewish nation, the branches, can also become holy by the same uh, way that the roots became holy, namely uh, obedience to the gospel. In verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off and you, uh, that is 
the believing Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, that is, they were not part of the nation of Israel, and being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, that is, the believing Jews, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, and that's the spiritual blessings in Christ. Uh, of course, it goes on reading uh, verse 18, do not boast against the branches. We'll get to that in a moment. Some of the Jews were rejected because they refused to obey the Christ. These are the branches that were broken off. But the believing Gentiles were grafted in and became partakers of the spiritual blessings enjoyed by Christians. Therefore, believing Jew and Gentile alike enjoyed the very same spiritual blessings. There is no difference between them. The Gentiles are called a wild olive branch because they were without a written revelation or prophets and consequently were measurably unenlightened in their duty to God compared to Israel. But when the gospel was presented to them, they obeyed it and received entry into the abode of the saved, that is, the church. If they were grafted in implies that the believing and obedient Jews constituted the church at first. Subsequently, the Jews entered the church in exactly the same way and on the same basis. Thus, the two, Jew and Gentile, constituted the one body of Christ. The, this one body was not the reconstituted nation of Israel, but was a new man. The church had no previous existence. It, is, it was composed of new creatures, of living stones, and so it was a spiritual house. It was no outgrowth of some previously existing institution, but an original, without genealogy, antecedent, or type. It was new in its foundation, structure, head, and spirit. To become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree is to partake in the blessings of the gospel. These blessings were first tendered to the Jews and, for a while, enjoyed only by them. In fact, it was the Jews that first tendered it to the Gentiles, so both were partakers. And then the continuation of verse 17 uh, is in verse 18. So do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Although Israel was rejected and the Gentiles accepted, the Gentiles are here warned to not be toward uh, the rejected Jews as they have been toward the Gentiles. But if the Gentiles were so inclined to boast, Remember that the Jews owe you Gentiles nothing, but you Gentiles owe them a great deal. From them, the Jews, came Christ in the flesh. The first church was composed of Jews. The apostles were Jews. And by the Jews, the gospel was first preached to you. All this considered, you must not boast against them. You don't have a basis to do it. In verse 19 of Romans 11, uh, you will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Now, the Gentiles still might have a slight uh, tendency to boast of it, just a little bit. The Gentiles may say that the Jews were rejected, that we Gentiles might be accepted. The Jews were not, however, rejected, so that the Gentiles might be received. The Jews were rejected solely because of their unbelief. Uh, 
their rejection was not essential to the Gentiles' reception. Therefore, their reception was not the objective of the Jews' rejection. The object in rejecting the Jews was to punish them for their sin. In verse 20, well said, Paul writes, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Paul uh, concedes that the Jews were broken off because of unbelief, whereas the Gentile is accepted because of his faith. Uh, but conceding the two facts is not asserting their dependence. The one is not dependent on the other. The Jews were broken off because of unbelief. God did not unconditionally preordain their unbelief or rejection of Christ. It was completely their own choice. God left them free to choose between belief and unbelief, and they chose unbelief. God's ability to foresee their choice has no bearing on their choice. The Gentiles stand by faith and for no other reason or cause. They stand in the body of Christ as you would have stood if all Jews had rejected Christ, if all Jews had accepted Christ, or if the Jews had never existed. The standing of the Gentile was his own, not another's. The Jew was never rejected to make room for the Gentile. So the Gentile is advised to not be haughty because he did not hold their place as the favorite of God by some unalterable decree. They too may be rejected just as the Jew was and for the same reason. Therefore, Paul says, do not be high-minded or overconfident or you may suffer the, the same fate as the unbelieving Jews. In verse 21 of chapter 11, she says, For God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you, you either. The Jews are said to be the natural branches as, as opposed to grafted in branches, that is, the Gentiles. He, he would not spare the natural branches when they refused to believe in his son. The Gentiles then must not expect him to spare them if they become unbelieving. God is no respecter of persons. He is no more inclined to save one over another based on the person. He will say he will spare neither in unbelief. He accepts and spares only on condition of belief in Christ and unconditionally rejects uh, those in its absence, the absence of belief in Christ. In verse uh, 22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fail, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also would be cut off. The Jews refused to believe in Christ and therefore fell. That is, they were, they were rejected. The cutting off was not arbitrary or unconditional. It was uh, predicated on unbelief. Contrarily, he says to the Gentiles, if you Gentiles continue steadfast in belief and obedience, God will continue to shower his blessings on you. But should you Gentiles prove yourself unworthy of God's kindness, as the rejected Jews had done, should you become unbelieving and disobedient, you also will be cut off as they have been. God's goodness is his love and mercy bestowed in Christ, realized in one's remission of sins, and an and a eternal home in heaven. Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. 
So the uh, unbelieving Jews had been removed from the tree. Um, but if they believe and repent, they can be grafted in just as the Jews had been grafted in. He will do no more for them than he had done for the Gentiles, nor will he do any less. Now see, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we'll start here with verse 24 next week. Thank you for your kind attention.